Hi guys, Mrs Moon here, checking in with um, some more chapters of A Boy and a Bear in a Boat. Uh, we are on page 164, and this chapter is called The Thing from the Deep. The bear leaped straight at the thing's dreadful face, but the creature raised a swift tentacle from the water and struck the bear in the belly, batting him up into the air. He twisted his body as he flew upwards, turned a graceful loop, and landed neatly on the thing's head. Then he started belting it with the mallet. Don't hit him, shouted the boy. Ask him if he knows the way. The bear stuck to his task, swinging the mallet with all of his strength repeatedly at the monster's head. He looked determined and angry. We thwack are thwack. Not thwack. Lost. Crunch splash. Oh, said the bear. The handle of the mallet had snapped with the last blow and the head of it had dropped into the water. So far as the bear could tell, the enormous, scary, dangerous monster did not seem to have become any less enormous, scary or dangerous as a result of being hit repeatedly on the head. Ah, said the bear. I think you've made it angry, shouted the boy. That probably wasn't such a good idea. No, said the bear. Probably not. The thing reached up a slimy tentacle and made a grab at the bear. The bear twisted and ducked under it, but the slippery goo that oozed from the creature's skin made him lose his footing and slip from the top of its head. Thrashing his arms about as he fell, he managed to grab onto one of the beast's antennae. He had avoided falling off completely, but now he was dangling in front of the monster's massive face. Try to stay away from its mouth, shouted the boy helpfully. I think it's still hungry. I'll bear that in mind, said the bear. He gazed into the monster's many eyes. With his free paw, he gave a little wave. The monster did not wave back. Instead, it shook its head, bouncing the bear around at the end of the antenna like a fish on the end of a line. It opened its mouth wide, exposing its countless teeth and dribbling thick, snotty drool down its front. Its jaws slammed shut again and again, snapping at the bear as he swayed and swung and bounced around in the air, clinging on as best as he could. As he twisted and bent his body to keep clear of a toothy death. Cool dear, he said. Your breath smells rotten. And then suddenly the monster stopped thrashing away and remained a moment, for a moment perfectly still, as it regarded the bear gradually swinging to a halt before its many, many eyes. The bear stared back, unblinking with a faint, rather friendly smile. Have you had enough now? He said. Do you give up? Something tapped him on the shoulder. He twisted around to see a gigantic slimy tentacle poised in the air behind him, swaying a little from side to side like a cobra waiting to strike. Oh dear, said the bear. The tentacle lashed violently towards him, but rather than striking him, coiled around him, gripping him hard into a spiralling embrace from neck to toes. Oh, said the bear. The monster gave him a squeeze. Ow, said the bear. Then the creature raised the bear high into the air and tilted back its head and after emitting a noise like a volcano laughing, dropped him into its mouth. And then spat him. it spat him straight out again. The bear flew through the air, foul-smelling gobs of thick spittle trailing in his wake and landed with a splash some distance away. The creature did not notice. It had turned its attention to the boat where the boy stood, rather nervously, holding his oar with which he had just jabbed the monster very hard in the stomach. It seemed like a good idea at the time. 
Don't even think about it, said the boy unconvincingly, wafting the oar in front of him rather limply while backing slowly and unsteadily away across the hull of the Harrier. The boat itself was moving away from the creature too, the prod of the oar had s having set it in motion. The creature straightened itself, looming high above the boat, blocking out the sun and plunging the boy into gloom. Into gloom. Still edging backwards, the boy peered up at its awful face. It was hard to read its expression. The boy was used to faces with far fewer eyes, but it seemed safe to assume that it wasn't happy. It raised two writhing, writhing snaking tentacles high above the water and then brought them down crashing and then brought them crashing down on either side of the harrier. The boat shot upwards on a plume of water, sending the boy flying onto his back. The oar dropped from his hands and the boy scrambled halfway to his feet when two more tentacles smashed down into the water and another mighty wave shot the boat into the air. The boy's oars and everything else in the boat went flying. The boy landed hard at the bottom of the boat with the oars and pans and stove and who knew what else beneath and over him and all of it in inches deep water. The sponge that the bear had brought up from the seabed landed on his head and bounced away somewhere. For a moment, nothing happened. The boy lay there, propped up on his elbows, amid the chaos of scattered and battered belongings. He tried to get up but banged his head against something. One of the oars had landed against the centre bench, its blade down in the bow section behind him, its handle up at a wide angle, his, his hand, its handle up at an angle pointing at the beast. He had to wiggle around it as he got unsteadily to his feet, cautiously, half expecting the monster to toss the boat about some more, but he had, got, he had tired of playing games now. The creature arched its body, its mouth gaping wide, and issued a hideous roar that the boy could feel like a stinking girl as well as here. Instinctively, he jumped backwards. One foot landed on the sponge, now saturated and slippery. His foot slid from beneath him, and he toppled over, his full weight landing on the oar handle, smashing it downward. The other end of the oar shot up into the air, scooping up as it did so the very last sandwich, and shooting it over the sprawling boy. He watched it fly, as if in smoke, slow motion, curving through the air. It landed perfectly inside the gaping mouth of the sea monster. The beast gave an involuntary gulp and came to an instant halt. The boy hauled himself half upright, watching. The monster was still and quiet. The boat rocked gently back to equilibrium. The boy could hear the faint splashing of the distant bear swimming towards the boat, but he didn't look round. Then there was a noise, a small noise, from somewhere deep inside the creature. It squinted, one eye closed in discomfort, and but otherwise remained quite still. Then another noise, a little louder, a dull, gurgling thud, like a small explosion. The closed eye opened and two other ones closed. A low rumble and the beast's eyes bulged and its face puffed up. It opened its mouth and belched neatly, seemingly rather relieved. It just had time to turn its attention to the boy again before another, before another rumble made its body shake. Then another, louder and longer, and the monster's eyes were shutting and opening, mad, like lights blinking on and off. It groaned and closed all of its eyes tight shut, as if concentrating hard. Somewhere very deep in the sea, something went boom, and the waters around the boat frothed with gigantic bubbles, and the air filled with a terrible but familiar stench. Ooh, said the boy disgusting. Then, after the briefest pause, the noises started up again, a continuous thundering rumble 
grew steadily in volume, accompanied by a series of increasingly violent explosions. To this dark music, the creature began to dance. It swayed and shook and jerked in time to the strange rhythms of its own insides. Its movements became bigger and wide, wilder as the noises grew louder. Its tentacles thrashed crazily, slapping at the water in a terrifying frenzy, churning at the sea and pushing the little boat away at some speed. The boy looked on, fascinated and appalled. He dimly registered that the bear had climbed onto the boat and joined him, watching the, the weird spectacle before them. The monster howled and jagged a jagged, high-pitched, unearthly noise, adding to the general farting, thrashing, splashing figure. Its, bo its body writhed, its tentacles flailed, the boat rocked and bucked and jumped, and its startled occupants kept their eyes steadily on the creature. Then it stopped. The banging and the booming, the howling, all ceased in an instant. And the monster froze. The great tangle of its tentacles made it look like a diagram of a very complicated knot. It was strangely beautiful. There was no sound except perhaps a strange sigh. Then it exploded, throwing out ragged lumps of stinky, slimy flesh and drawing a pattern of splashes in a wide circle on the surface of the sea. The remains of its body folded in on itself, its tentacles wilted, and it sank slowly beneath the water. Do you think it was something he ate? said the bear. Floating down. The boy and the bear tidied up the contents of the harrier, leaning over the opposite sides of the boat to scoop up seawater and did their best to wash away bits of exploded monster. They were happy and relieved to be alive and they laughed and joked easily as if their recent ordeal had forged between them a strong, deep friendship. This lasted about five minutes. You know, it was nice of you, but there was no need to interfere like that, said the bear. Defence of the vessel from the sea monsters really is a captain is really the captain's job, and I had the situation completely under control. Under control, said the boy. Yes, of course, said the bear. Under control from inside that thing's mouth. Um yes, said the bear. So what exactly was your plan to escape? said the boy. Oh, I didn't have a plan, said the bear. I never have a plan. No point in having a plan when you're a sea captain. When you are dealing with the sea, you have to be able to adapt at a moment's notice. You have to deal with each situation as it arises. There's no point in moaning about it. You just say, here is where we are. What do we do now? My dad taught me that. He was a sea captain too, you see. The bear looked off into the horizon. Or perhaps to somewhere beyond that. Probably still is, said the bear, wherever he's got to. The boy sighed. So, what would you have done without a plan to get free? He said. I don't know. I was about to have a brilliant idea, but I was interrupted, said the bear. Oh, said the boy, reaching down to the neck of his t-shirt to extract a gobble of pink blubber. Another of your brilliant ideas? He tossed a bit of monster into the water. Yes, said the bear. Only your last brilliant idea started with us having fish to eat and ended with us not having a fish to eat. Um, not to mention the nearly getting killed bit in the middle. Well, said the bear, there's nothing wrong with nearly getting killed. Actually getting killed. Now that would be annoying, but nearly getting killed is fine. I do it all the time. It's never done me any harm. Is that meant to make me feel better? Yes, said the bear. The boy's stomach interrupted with a loud grumble. Well, it doesn't. A nice big fish to eat might make me feel better, but we don't have one of those anymore, thanks to you. We can catch another fish, said the bear. No, we can't, said the boy. The fishing rod's gone. 
It must have fallen out when the gigantic sea monster was playing patter cake with the boat. Oh, said the bear. He looked a little concerned. But we've still got the save, haven't we? Yes, said the boy. But why do you care when we've got nothing to cook on it? Well, it's almost four, said the bear. I can't believe, said the boy, that you're worrying about tea. The boy realised he was speaking quite loudly now. Not shouting exactly, but not far off. And he had climbed onto the central seat so that his face was almost on the same level as the bear's. And he was poking a finger into the bear's fur for emphasis. Actually, he thought, that's probably not a good idea. I should stop poking the bear. Don't poke me, said the bear. I'll poke you if I want to, said the boy. He poked the bear again, hard in the ribs. I really wish I wasn't doing that, he thought. I won't warn you again, said the bear. You can't tell me what to do, the boy heard himself say. He watched his finger jabbing into the bear and wondered why it wouldn't stop. I'm the captain, said the bear. I can order you to stop. Ha! said the boy. Some captain you are, days at sea, with no sign of land, no food, no idea we, where we are. We are not lost, shouted the bear. And your stupid hat doesn't even fit properly, said the boy. His finger, like something that was no longer a part of him, stopped poking at the bear and shot up as if to knock the hat from the bear's head. It didn't get there. The bear's paw grabbed his wrist and held it still with an uncomfortable relief, an uncomfortably firm grip. Don't you ever, growled the bear, touch the captain's hat. He stared angrily into the boy's eyes. The boy stared angrily back. He didn't want to, but somehow he couldn't stop himself. I should apologise, thought the boy. If I say the wrong thing now, he might actually break my hand off. I should apologise. I'll apologise. You're the worst captain ever, said the boy. Oh, that wasn't meant to happen, thought the boy. That wasn't meant to happen at all. The boy found he was gazing off into the distance. He gulped and looked back to the bear, expecting to meet with a terrifying stare. But instead, he found that the bear was looking up into the air between them. Something small and blue and fuzzy was there, falling slowly down. The boy lifted his head and focused it on his eyes, twitching as they followed its movements. It was a feather. It rocked and turned and twirled and danced as it fell, and the boy, hypnotised, slowly lowered his head as he followed its descent. It came to a stop on the tip of the bear's nose. The boy and the bear stared hard at the feather, the bear almost cross-eyed. They stared and they said nothing. They hadn't seen a bird in days. They stared at the feather and then they stared at each other. Then they stared at the feather again. It was a beautiful thing, rich blue in colour, shiny and perfect with a gentle curl to it, sat on the bear's nose, basking in the afternoon light. Then the bear sneezed, waking them both from their trance and shooting the feather back up into the air. They followed it with their eyes and then both looked beyond it, searching the sky. A feather, said the boy. From a bird, said the bear. Do you see it, said the boy. No, said the bear. If we can spot it, said the boy. We could follow it wherever it's come from, said the bear. There might be food there. Oh, I was just thinking we'd catch it and eat it. That's plan B, do you see it? No. They stood there, turning around, twisting their necks, searching the sky. There, said the bear at last, pointing very definitely to a particular patch of sky. The boy examined it closely. Where? I don't see. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The cloudless blue sky had a tiny dark speck in it. Well, don't just stand there, said the boy. Get rowing. But when he looked down again, he saw that the bear was already back in his seat, pulling hard on the oars, speeding them across the water. 
Kark. The bear rode and the boy stood on his seat, keeping an eye on the bird. Now and then he would correct their direction with an urgent word to the bear or a gesture with his hand. A little more, a little left. No, my left. That's it. Even with all of his efforts, the bear could not row the harrier as fast as the bird can fly. But luckily, this particular bird seemed content to dawdle. Sometimes it would circle around for a while and then catch up on it, the dark speck growing bigger and occasionally catching the sunlight, flashing a startling iridescent blue. At one point, it dived down into the water and the boy lost sight of it for a long, frightened second for long frightened seconds before it rose again into the air. They were close enough that the boy could just make out that it had a fish in its beak. Good, said the bear. The extra weight might slow him down. He glanced over his shoulder to check their progress without breaking the rhythm of his stroke. Good, he said again. He was right. The bird slowed and increasingly often it paused and spent some time circling in the air before setting off again on a slightly different course. They drew closer and closer to it, the boy seeing it ever more clearly, but there was still no sign of it on the horizon to indicate that it was heading for land. It seems to be looking around, said the boy, trying to work out which way to go. Maybe it's lost too. We are not lost, said the bear, and I don't think the bird that that bird is either. Now tell me. Am I heading straight towards it? The boy said nothing but indicated with an outstretched arm a minor adjustment in that course to starboard. The bear gave a more powerful stroke to his right oar than to the left and the harriet shifted direction perfectly. The boy gave the bear a nod of approval which just for a second took his eyes off the bird. He looked back up and found it again instantly but oddly, though they were closer now, it was harder to see. The bright blue was not so bright now, but it was too early in the day for the light to be fading. He squinted at the bird and rubbed his eyes. What's wrong? said the bear. I don't know, said the boy. The bird was vague, smudged now. I think there's something wrong with my eyes, said the boy. He sounded scared. The bear looked around and spotted the bird and carried on rowing. Your eyes are fine, he said. Then why? the boy trailed off. Mist, said the bear. It fell quickly and thickened. After so many clear days with nothing to look at, here was mist to hide their first glimpse of hope. The air turned cold around them in an instant, and the boy's smudge, the blue smudge of the bird dissolved before the boy's eyes. The bear kept rowing. Which way? he said. I'm not sure, said the boy, staring around as hard as he could, casting his eyes round this way and that. He caught a glimpse of colour and raised a straight arm towards it. There, he said. The bear adjusted his stroke and steered the boat around as instructed and powered on. But the mist grew thicker still and the boy lost sight of the bird again. I can't see it. Just keep looking. I am lo keeping looking. You keep rowing. I am rowing. Does it look like I'm not rowing? I don't know. I'm not looking at you. Well, does it sound like I'm not rowing? All right, all right, shut up. Let me concentrate. The boy turned and twisted, but it was no use. He could hardly even see the bear now. I can't see it. Stop rowing. Stop rowing? First you say keep rowing. Now you say stop rowing. Make up your mind. Stop rowing, said the boy. Well, if you're just going to give up and shut up, said the boy. The bear stopped rowing and shut up and the boy was right. There was no point in ca carrying on blindly on. They might be heading away from the bird for all they knew. 
The mist covered everything. He looked at the faint shape of the boy, standing, still standing, poised and alert on his seat. And even now, the bear could tell that he was concentrating very hard. But why? There was no way he could see anything. Caw! said the bird. It was a faint noise, but not so faint that they couldn't tell roughly which direction it had come from. The bear set off again. They went on, neither saying a word. Caw! That's close, said the boy, and straight ahead. Straight ahead it is, said the bear. The boy couldn't see anything now, but he could feel how fast they were going. The bear was sending them along at a tremendous pace. Now we are getting somewhere, said the bear. And the boy was about to reply when, bump. Oh, said the boy. Oof, said the bear. Ow, said the boy. Then no one said anything for a while. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. Um, I hope that you enjoyed these few chapters and I hope that you've got in your mind maybe something that the boy and the bear in the boat might have hit to mean that they have gone um, um, what, what they might they have bumped into in the sea. Um, I will check in again soon with some more chapters. I'll speak to you.